Hello students. I want us to look at one aspect under genetics and variation. There are many aspects, but uh, this aspect I want us to look at this time around is very, very important because it's one of the foundations that need to be known under genetics. The word genetics was coined by a scientist named William Bipp in 1906. But to let you know that there are some aspects in this part of biology that we have some scientists that started them. Though William Bateson named it genetics, but actually it started from a monk called Gregor Mendel. After the death of Gregor Mendel, it was then they knew that what he was doing as a gardener was genetics. Initially, when he started this, it was not noticed. But later, they found out that his experiment was useful to what they know this time around. That is why Gregor Mendel was named the father of genetics. But something happened when he was performing his experiment. He postulated two laws in which the whole thing under genetics now hand on. There are two main uh, laws that are postulated by Gregor Mendel. We name them Mendelian laws or genetic laws. We have number one, first Mendelian law, and number two, second Mendelian law. The summary of the first Mendelian law is the law of segregation. Why the second Mendelian law is the law of independent assortment of genes. But I want you to understand that these two laws, if you're able to understand them, you will not have problem with genetics. Now, before I will now state the two laws, I need to explain some things to you about some terms in genetics. Though we have many terms. But the terms I want to explain now, we are go I'm going to use them in these two laws when I want to explain. That is why you need to know these terms. I will only mention a few terms, but later, when we want to look at another aspect, I will talk about other terms. Now, the first term we want to look at now alleles. Alleles or allelomorphy. What are alleles? Alleles is a pair of genes that are responsible or controlling a pair of contrasting characters. Now, what happened is that it is known that genes, they are the hereditary materials that are contained or carried by the chromosomes present in the nucleus. You know that in a cell, there is nucleus. We believe that 
cell is the basic unit of life. Now, the life of the living organism resides in the cell. And we are able to know that the cell has nucleus. And within the nucleus of the cell, there are chromosomes. It is through these chromosomes found in the nucleus of the cell that we have transmission of characters now from that cell to another cell which can be found in another organism. Please take note of this. These genes are located on the chromosomes and genes they are the hereditary materials that are contained in the chromosomes. They are located on the chromosomes. Now you can see now that the characters that are transmitted from parents to the offspring, they are transmitted through the genes. Now, you will now see again that these genes, before we can see the expression of the character carried by that gene, it must be in pair. Now, this pair of genes, controlling or responsible for a character before any character expressed by any organism is being controlled by a pair of genes. So that pair of gene, genes is called what? Alleles or allelomorphic. But these alleles or allelomorphic now can be dominant or recessive. Now, we want to see what you call dominant gene, what you call recessive gene. Now, a gene is dominant when that gene is expressed in the next generation. Take for example, you cross a red flower plant with white flower plant. When that plant now wants to flower, now produce red flower. I will still tell you how we come about that. But you will now see now that that gene that is for red is the one that is expressed in the next generation. Is the dominant gene. But you can see now that that flower color is the character. But that contracting character is the red and white. So a character must be contrasting. Take for example, woman eye. He said that you are tall or you are short. So there is a particular gene for shortness and there is a particular gene for tallness. Now, recessive gene is the gene that is suppressed in the next generation. It is known that dominant gene, which is the one that is expressed in the next generation, is always designated with capital letter. Why the recessive gene is designated with small letter? But this dominant gene and recessive gene can be homozygous or heterozygous. It is homozygous when a pair of gene responsible or controlling a pair of contrasting character are the same. Take for example, capital R, capital R, or small r, small r. This is a pair of genes. This is a pair of genes. Now you can see now that they are the same and they are the same. This is homozygous, homozygous dominant. This is homozygous recessive. I told you that when it is dominant, they use capital letter. When it is recessive, they use small letter. So, and the, when we have a pair of genes controlling a pair of contrasting character, now the same, that is homozygous dominant. This is homozygous recessive. Now, I'm able to explain what we call homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. Then we need to know what we call phenotype and genotype. Because it is from the expression of this homozygous, heterozygous, 
that we can know the genotype and the phenotype of the offspring. Because definitely, when we have offspring from the parent, the expression of the genes found in these parents will definitely show us the phenotype and the genotype of that offspring. What is the phenotype? Phenotype is the physical appearance of an individual. Why genotype is the genetic constitution of an individual or the total sum of genes inherited from both parents. Now, it is possible that an offspring can resemble the father physically and say, oh, look at that girl. You look like your father physically. What? You and your father, you have the same thing. That is, phenotypically, that girl and the father, they look alike physically. So, phenotypically, they are the same. Now, genotypically, it is possible for identical twins to be the same physically, but different genotypically. That is, the total sum of genes found in the, in the offsprings of the same parents are different. So it's, it's, it's telling us that children of the same parents, genotypically, they are different. They may, they, they may be the same physically, that is, they may have the same physical appearance, but they, can, they may have what, the, you know, different words, genotype, that is, different genetic constitution. Now, having known this, now, let's now use it now to explain now the first law and the second law. I told you that the first law, the summary of the first law is the law of segregation. Why the summary of the second law is the law of independent assortment of genes. Now, you will now see the first law states that Genes are responsible for the development of, of an individual and they are transmitted from one generation to another without alteration. Or we can say that during zygote formation, each pair of genes separate and transmitted from one generation to another without alteration. Now, what he's telling us is that the first law, according to Mendel, it tells us that a pair of genes is responsible for a pair of contrasting character. So, what we want to know is that if you know what, what happened to a pair of genes, we can know what happened to other genes. So he consider only a character which is being controlled by a pair of genes. I believe you are following. Now, you will see again that in his explanation, when he wanted to perform his experiment, he used pig plants. He crossed the pure stock of red flower plant with pure stock of white flowered plant. What I'm saying is this. The red flower plant that is the, the same pea plant one produces red flower he now found that, that the same set you know the same pea plant some you no know, produce what produces what white flower ah, he now wondered what he he, he he now crossed the two how did they cross them there is what you call pollination in plants. He now put the pollen grain of the red flower plant 
on the stigma of the white flower plant that is cross pollination because we know that pollen grain is the main gamete in plant why stigma is part of the female reproductive system because it is through the stigma that the pollen too will now grow to where we have the ovo ovo which is the female gamete now that is where the pollination is done so there is crossing through pollination in plant so when it cross the red flower plant with white flower plant there was pollination it was this pollination that led to what fertilization and after fertilization there was fruit and seed development so the the two of them now produce seed so we're able to know that in this seed we are having the genes for red flower and the genes for white flower in that seed. In, by the time he planted the seed, he now found out that when the seed was planted, now, when that seed will flower now, all the flowers produced by this seed that contain red flower plant gene and red white flower plant gene they all produce red flower which shows that the red flower gene is dominant over white flower gene i want you to know this in f1 generation that is first filia generation under genetics it is the gene that is dominant is always fully expressed at times in some question they will not tell you the gene that is dominant but it is the expression of what you are now told that what that, that happened in the f1 generation that is the first filler generation you'll be able to know the gene that is dominant so in this case now because it is the red flower plant that was produced in the first filler generation that shows that the red flower gene is dominant over what white flower gene. So that's why we're able to know that the red flower is dominant gene is dominant over white flower gene. And in genetics, capital letter, the first letter of that character that is dominant is always used. The capital letter of it is always used to designate the dominant gene. Now look at it. Red flowered plants. So what we use to designate it is what? Capital R, capital R. Now white flowered plants. We use small r, small r. Please take note of this. W start white. R start red. You won't say because W start white, you use W to, rep to designate white. You'll be wrong in genetics. In genetics, it is the small letter of that dominant one that will be used to designate the recessive. That is why I'm using small r, small r, which is the small letter of the R that is dominant. If you don't take note of this in genetics, you'll be penalized. So, he crossed red flower plant with what? White flower plant. So this one represents the genotype of the parents. So the two parents now, we have what? Now this one represents genotypic genotype of parents. Now, and you know that for any pair of genes, there is always gamete because it is from the parent that gametes will be produced. Now, what happens is that the number of pair of genes determines the number of gametes because the gametes are the ones that fuse together 
that will result to zygote. It is this zygote, after cell division and multiplication of cells, that will result to an individual. So definitely, this is a pair of gene. This is a pair of gene. Now they must be located in the gene, in the gamete. Because according to the first law, which says that each pair of gene will separate during gamete. So each this one will separate. So how will you know the number of gametes when you are given a pair of gene? Now, to know the number of gametes that we produce from pair, a pair of gene, it is through 2n raised, 2 raised to the power of n. Where n represents the number of pair of genes. So, when you want to know, at times they can give you the, you know, a pair of genes, a pair of genes. And they will not ask you to tell them the number of gametes. Just know that it's 2 raised to the power of n. Where n represents the number of pairs of genes. Now, you will now see that in this a pair now, to know the number of gametes is going to be 2 raised to the power of 1 because we are considering a pair, which, is, which represents 2 gametes. Now, if you are given two pairs of genes, let's say capital R, capital R, capital Y, capital Y, a pair and a pair, and we're having two pairs. To know the number of gametes now will be what? 2 raised to the power of n. 2 raised to the power of 4, which represents what? 2 raised to the power of 2, which now represents 2 times 2. Give us what? 4 gametes. So you can do this on your own. Try the number of pairs of genes. So that shows that if you are given three pairs of genes and you want to know the number of gametes that can be produced from these three pairs of genes, it's going to be three raised to the power, two raised to the power of three. Two times two times two, making what? Making eight gametes. So that one is settled to know the number of gametes. Now, you will now know again that we need to distinguish gametes from the genotype of the parents. Note this, in genetics, gametes are always circled. Please take note of that. If you, if you, if you designate gametes, you don't circle it, you don't know what, you know, you won't get what they are saying. So, to come back to this, I believe you must have written this. Now, to come back to where we started, this is a pair of genes. So it will give us two gametes because it's a pair of genes, it's two raised to the power of one. So look at it. In your mind, divide this in your mind. Just divide it in your mind. This one will go to one gamete, this one will go to one gamete because there is going to be separation. Now, so if you, that is if you have 1,000 pairs on a chromosome, this 1,000 pairs, each of them will separate as we are going to consider a pair of gene now. So the same thing. So we are having this in one gamete. We are having this in another gamete. So you can see now that this one that I circle now, these two represent what? Gametes. It is possible they can draw the chart and they ask you to, to, to identify gametes. So the one that is circled represent gamut. So this also will go to another gamut. This one will go to another gamut. I believe you are, you are following. Now, you will now see now that from the gamut, we'll be able to know the number of offspring. Because it is when this gamut now fuse together that will result to offspring. Now, to know the number of offspring, is based on the number of gametes. You know, you, if you can recall, to know the number of gametes, we know the number of gametes from the number of pairs of genes. Now, we know the number of offsprings from the number of gametes. Now, in order to know the number of offsprings, it's also based on 2 raised to the power of n, where n represents the number of gametes. Now, look at it. When we wanted to know the number of gametes, which is also based on 2 raised to the power of n, is based on the number of pairs of genes. 
Now, I want to know the number of offspring because it's when the garments now fit together that will result to the offspring. Now, to know the number of offspring is also based on the number of garments. Now, the number of garments now determine the number of offspring. And which is still the same formula, 2 raised to the power of n, where n represents the number of garments. Now, as we are having two gametes here now, so it's got to be what? 2 raised to the power of 2 represents what? 4 offsprings. Now, I think we are having 4 gametes now. 4 gametes, that shows that if I'm having 4 gametes, it's got to be what? Now, 2 raised to the power of 4, which represents what? 16 offsprings. So, the number of offsprings is known from the number of gametes. Why the number of gametes is known from the number of pairs of genes. And it is based on 2 raised to the power of n. So, if you want to know the number of gametes, now that n will represent what? Now, the number of pairs of genes. Now, if you want to know the number of offsprings, that n will represent the number of gametes. Now, from the from what we have here, I, I believe you must have written this. Now, I want to show you the number of offspring. Now, look at it. This gamut, I'm going to take them one by one to know the number because I must get four. How? This is a gamut. I will use this gamut to cross everything this side. Look at it. Look at it. We give me capital R, small r. You know, I've used to cross this, so I will still use to cross this one. Now, look at it. Capital R, small r. So I finished with this gamut. Now let me come to the next gamut. This gamut I will use to cross with everything at the other side I did for the first one. So look at it now. Look at it. So how many gametes now? How many offspring? Four offspring. So this represents what? Offspring. So he now found out that in F1 generation, that is first filler generation, all red. What do we call filler generation? Filler generation represents the offsprings of parents. Now, if you count this from our grandparents, we are the offsprings of our parents. Now, our parents are the offspring of our grandparents, but we are the offsprings of our parents. So our parents now, directly, they are the offspring of our grandparents. That shows that they are the first filler generation. So we are the second filler generation. So likewise here now, these four are the first filler generation. And in F1 generation, according to the, men, the first Mendelia law, all were red, but they are heterozygous red. Heterozygous is when a pair of genes controlling or response for a pair of contrasting characters are different. So all were red. So this is heterozygous red. One capital and one small. If it is homozygous, the two of them will work capital, capital. But heterozygous dominant. Because this capital R will still suppress the expression of this small R. So this is heterozygous red. This is homozygous red. This is homozygous. This is homozygous white. So homozygous red, homozygous white, heterozygous red. So in F1 generation, he now got out all red. Now he proceeded by cross crossing the F1 generation. Now by crossing the F1 generation. Now. We are able to know that in F1, all were capital R except cross. So this one will give me two gametes as I did the other time. Look at it. Now, but the, uh, now the two of them now will now give me four offsprings because I'm considering the two gametes. So this one is capital R, capital R. This one is capital R, small r. This one is capital R, small r. This one is small r, small r. So we're able to see that 
This represents what? Second filia generation. Mind you, second filia generation. That is, the offsprings in the next gen. In the first law, we were able to see that men they considered a character which is being controlled by a pair of genes. And in this, we were able to see that he considered the flower color and he crossed red flower plant with white flower plant and in first filial generation all were red. Now Mendel he proceeded by crossing the F1 generation. He self crossed the F1 generation. Now in the F1 generation, the genotype were capital R, small r, cross with capital R, small r. Now, these two parents, they are the products of F1 generation. He now self cross. He self cross. Now, these two now represent the parents now. Now, from what we know, a pair of genes will give us two gametes. And I told you that we normally circle gametes. These are the two gametes that are produced. Now, this gamete will cross with this, fuse with that to form capital R, capital R. This one will fix with this to form capital R small r. This one will fix with this group, capital R small r. And this one will form small r small r. Now, these possible genotypes represent the genotype of the F2 generation. That is, second filia generation. In the last class, I told you that filia generation represents now, the offsprings of parents. Now, if you look at the second filial generation now, there are three possible genotypes. Capital R, capital R, capital R, small r, and small r, small r. Now, from this second filial generation, we can determine genotypic ratio and phenotypic ratio. Now, from the F2, F2 generation, the genotypic ratio is ratio 1 to 2 to 1. What I'm saying is that I'm having one capital R, capital R, and I'm having two capital R, small r. Then I'm having one small r, small r, representing genotypic ratio. Phenotypic ratio is ratio 3 to 1. That is, these three with the red and only these with the white. And also, this genotypic ratio is also known as monohybrid ratio. The reason why it's called monohybrid ratio is because in first, in first law of Mendel, a pair of gene, genes now was considered. And it is this one pair of gene that shows the expression of a character. That is why it's based on monohybrid crossing. And because it's based on monohybrid crossing, the phenotypic ratio there is also known as monohybrid ratio. Now, we can sh they can give you calculation under this. Let's say, for example, they are, you, are you are now told now that there are 120 plants. 
From these 120 plants, how many of them will produce red flower? How many will produce white flower? Now, to know the number of plants that will produce red flower, we were able to know that two out of the three out of the four phenotypic ratio that we have, we have three that will be red and one that is now white. So now number of plants that we produce we produce red flower is equal to 3 over 4 multiplied by 120 giving us 90 plants now number of plants that we produce white flower is got 1 over 4 multiplied by 120 now giving me 30 plants so from the expression so you can determine the number of plants that will produce the red and the white flower so that is the full expression of the first law of Mendel. Thank you.